Okay, we're back. Uh, back to the system board. Let's do let's do a couple of announcements. So we all understand that next week is our midterm, right? So we will first uh, on Tuesday. I will do a recap. I mean, usually people vote, vote for a recap lecture, although, uh, well, let's let's say it's useful, right? So I, I agree, it's useful. So what we're gonna do is just mostly. Uh, it will be a chance for you to ask me questions and I will be solving, uh, let's say, midterm questions from a couple of years ago. And again, so all the midterm questions are generally available online. So we usually release them. If there is, there is no entry from last year, you just ask me and I will make sure that it's online. But uh, just to make sure we understand it's there. So... Uh, what is that? Let's just go to the class page. Mm, this is it. So we have uh, midterm. Okay, this is a review pop up by examples from previous years. So maybe we don't have 2023. So I have to add it here. But uh, on like, like this, these are the classes from previous years. And you can, you're welcome to like go through them. Sometimes they have solutions, sometimes they don't, uh, but at least you will get a good good feeling of what is that we usually ask uh, during the midterm. A couple of uh, just, uh, I, wanna, I wanna go through this uh, now just so you have a little bit more time. So the midterm is uh, open everything besides you cannot search, cannot communicate, cannot use tools like ChatGPT, but you can use your computers, you can use any lecture notes. You can use uh, uh, any tools like OpDump, ReadElf. You can compile code if you like. You can read the source of the kernel, stuff like that, right? So that's that's allowed. So I suggest to have it uh, on grade scope so I don't have to print a bunch of paper copies and then scan them back. So if you really need a paper copy, I will figure out how to print it for you. But Usually people say grade scope is fine. It's just easier for us as well. Okay, questions. So let me take it here. Sorry. No, actually, yeah, good point. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I request you to be here. And uh, like depending on how 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 bad people are, we have different mechanisms of enforcing attendance and uh, actually assigned seating as well because. Uh, if we let people to sit together, then, you know, something starts brewing very, very quickly. And so we usually might, uh, like, on a bad year, which, like, on average became our average year, we actually assign you sitting, right? So uh, we most likely will do it again. So it will not be, it will not be, like, again, like, probably we'll seat everyone randomly uh, on a, every other seat. And I will ask you to bring your ID and we will enforce. So I'll, I'll, we will go with TAs and go check your IDs, uh, making sure that you're in class. And you're, if you're not in class, I'll ask you a question online. Where are you? And uh, I'll probably also take a picture of a class. So you will, like it's, it's very hard to argue that you, you were there, but you know, somehow I didn't see you. Uh, so that's the deal, sorry. That's uh, again, so we had some ridiculous stories about how people disappear during those or like group together, sit somewhere else, submit in grade school. Yeah. But thank you for this question. I forgot about it. Okay, any other questions? Um, can we use text? Yeah, totally. Like essentially like a short story is just no search. Why? Because like, uh, like originally we said, okay, you can use search. Chat GPT wasn't there back then. And people were like coming up with some ridiculous answers, you know, like we're just, just some, some semi-random collection. It's like li literally human generated chat GPT style answer. And they're like, I'll oh, really. So that's, let's not search and no communication, but everything else is allowed, right? So it's a very, very like uh, flexible setup. But it's like close to real life, you know, like no one will prevent you from searching uh, like or even like using Kenny helping materials, which means that you don't have to remember like anything, right? So you, you can always look it up. Like you, you find, I like if you say like, can I search through the lectures or through the class page? Sure, yeah, you can. Just don't don't Google random core questions or something. Uh, are the questions on the exam gonna reflect the class? Yeah, 
So roughly, and you you will like if you look at the previous years, you will see kind of the just and uh, like I used to say, and I will repeat it that I used to ask. Uh, I actually used to ask harder questions, uh, uh, and like uh, like now I use average questions. So they are not like super easy, but not super hard. So they're not dumb, let's put it this way. So you will have to think. And uh, the top people in a class are really people who invest invest uh, time in the class. And I, I see logic in what, what they answer. What else I wanted to say, I forgot. Uh, yeah, so, and everything is like uh, curved, right? So if I say, well, originally the, the higher score is 100, for example, and the highest student in a class gets 64, and 64 becomes the new 100. So that's the yeah, our A answer. So don't don't worry about you know about like performance. But we will come back to this uh, on Tuesday, and I will explain what what it means. And in, in general, like the class is graded very very permissively. So don't worry about the grades that much. Okay, the very small percentage of people get bad grades here. Okay, so good. So we're ready. Oh, one more question. Uh, will everything? <laughs> Right. Well, I don't know. We have a hardware problem with the projector, so this is how we have to. Uh, say again. You mean, uh, and uh, but you're welcome to come help me. What do you What do you think? <laughs> what? No, no, I'm not kidding. So, what do you think I can do with the remote? I think uh, something is wrong with the cable from. If I gently touch the HDMI cable, it kind of, I think, starts blinking a little more. This is really just thinking and turning that off and use that. Yeah, if you, if you want, do you want this all off on just one screen or no. blink for now? Yeah, blink for now. Uh, and then I will submit a request and hopefully someone come and fix it. Okay, so wait, hold on. There was a question about the exam or not? Uh, about the midterm. All good? Okay, good. Uh, okay, so then back to the system boot. So again, the plan for today is to uh, finish just just a couple of slides which which are left uh, uh, in this boot sequence, and then we will I will reiterate it. So go go over it again to make sure that we understand because when we read it the, from the first time, there is like there is a ton of hardware details, and it's hard to understand what's going on really, but. When you get to the end, and if you go backwards and do it again, it's much easier because it's really not that hard. And uh, then we're going to go and start uh, essentially seeing uh, we will find ourselves inside the main function of the kernel. Then what we're going to do next is to we're going to build a memory allocator for the kernel, like a very simple one. Okay, roughly speaking, where we stopped last time is that we say, okay, this is where we... This is how our environment looks like after we uh, like did a couple of things. So we essentially remember uh, the the bootloader left out left us at uh, the address seven c zero zero. This is where we started executing, and this is the bootloader. Uh, and essentially, it's this is the first piece of code which is under our control, right? So. Uh, this is what we can start programming. And so what we, like we said, okay, like what we're gonna do is that we quickly set up the uh, global descriptor table because this allows us to switch from 16 uh, bit mode to 32 bit mode of execution. And the reason is that, uh, you know, we want to start with some sizable amount of physical memory, right? Because 16 bits only allow you to address 64 kilobytes, right? So that's why. You know this thing is chosen in such a manner that you can actually address it in 16 in 16 bit mode of execution right but the moment we switch uh we can add uh, address all four gigabytes and machine might have actually a smaller amount of physical memory which is probably unrealistic today but was realistic a couple of years ago and now like on modern machines your end goal would be to switch into 64 bit mode right which is like not that hard but like almost there Right? So that's why uh, for now, I don't feel like it's too bad that we are like sticking to the 32-bit version of the system, uh, which is a little bit easier. Okay, cool. But then we said, okay, like 
We need the global descriptor table, but really we only need two entries, one for code, one for data. This one is marked as executable because uh, it's uh, it like the protection bits and such that we allow executing code from this segment. And this one is uh, actual, actually read and write. So, right. And uh, this is the linear addresses cover everything from address zero to four gigabytes. The base is zero, so there is no shift. So essentially any address which we see in register is the address which goes on a, on a memory bus, right? And uh, the bootloader, what we've, done, what we've done next is that we said, okay, like uh, enough of this assembly because it's hard to program and just in general inconvenient. So what we do is that we set up the tiny stack. We just randomly chose, I mean, not randomly, we, we thought about uh, which uh, physical memory is actually available. And we said, okay, it looks like that the memory uh, under 7C00 is unused. So we will set the stack pointer ESP to point to this re blue region and the stack will start growing this way, right? And after that, we jumped into C, started uh, reading the disk. And essentially what we just did with the disk is that from the disk, we loaded the kernel at the address uh, 100000. And I believe this is the one megabyte, right? Okay, so this seems okay. So. Our next step, which sounds a little unusual, is to say, look, we really want to remap. Right now, like our addresses are one to one, but we say, okay, we really want to remap the kernel in such a manner that the kernel shows up in our address space, in the virtual address space, at address two GBs plus one MB, right? So just shift it by two gigabytes, right? And that's again, that's that's if you ask me, is it strictly necessary? Well, no, but in the end, we want to have a user address space, uh, which looks like this. User programs and code and heap and data, everything occupy the lower part of the address space and the kernel occupies the upper part, right? And again, it's, it's a design choice. So you can build kernels in which the kernel occupies the lower addresses. I think this design choice was done for compatibility reasons because before you even had page tables, I think people said, okay, we're gonna execute programs at lower addresses here. So, and maybe maybe the idea is that, you know, these programs which are linked to run at address zero, if you provide provide a backward compatible POSIX interface or system call interface can continue running on this system, right? And uh, I say like, if I ask you a question, so what does it mean to remap the kernel to show up here? in the like in the addresses which are two gigabytes plus one megabyte. So what do we need to do for that? Do you remember? Correct. So what we just say, okay, like we're gonna construct a page table which maps those addresses. Like if you if you use four kilobyte pages, you just construct a page table which maps this page to page to physical page at physical address zero, right? But we said, okay, look, like it's uh, we don't really need this fine grain uh, pages, four kilobyte pages right now. So we're just gonna be using for now four megabyte pages because hardware supports them. And then what it means is that we only literally need one entry to do this mapping, right? Question. Correct, correct. And this is kind of important because I've seen people being confused about like. Are we like really moving something in memory? No, we just simply say, okay, the address at two gigabyte will be mapped to address zero. And so, then if you have it in register, sorry, just a sec, then it just the hardware will like route it correctly. So yeah, thank you. Uh, this also means like that every process in uh, memory space for the kernel is, is shared. Like one shared physical memory location? Correct. Okay. Right. And I mean, this is like uh, the topic of our second half of today is to explain a little bit uh, what is that we're building and how we share the kernel, how we're building those address spaces. Maybe not today, maybe next time after the spring break, probably. But yes, right. And this is natural because imagine you have a list of processes, right? And you do a system call, you have to access the same list, like, right? And so, Physically, it's the same data. You just access it to different addresses potentially. But in, in this case, like each process will have the kernel mapped at the same address as well. It will become more natural as we go forward and construct everything, right? 
at some point, like right now, it might look okay. Wait, this is very weird. But then, but then when you like like a couple of weeks into constructing those separate spaces, you say, yeah, this is like this is how I would do it. But there is also a lot of design choice in this, right? So, I mean, a design choice which is arguable or disputable. Uh, like I said, like it's totally fine to have the kernel at the lower addresses here and then user at the higher addresses. It's there is no real reason to to, to choose one or over another. In fact, keeping the kernel here might be even easier in some setups. But this is how X six is done. I don't really exactly know their reason. I would assume, as I said, like it's it's historical reason to support programs which are linked to run at address zero. But again, it's not really necessary. Uh, any any quick questions about this uh, overview of where we are? In our boot sequence, and again, I will like we'll talk through like how we how we set up everything. But at a high level, again, like it's it's conceptually looks kind of easy, right? You said okay, global descriptor table, fine. Switch to thirty two bit mode, good. Set up a stack, not so hard, right? And now we just remap the kernel. What else does real mode uh, to protect against? What what else is needed? You ask me. Yeah, what else? I think uh, I think this is it. To be honest, uh, right. So like uh, the CPU again for backward compatibility reasons, the CPU starts in sixteen bit mode, Intel CPU, which is a little like weird because you say look like there is so much work to just switch to thirty two bit mode, but that's just to make sure that if you run a legacy system, which is still 16, 16 bit, it, it can run on, it can boot, right? And I think uh, Intel might make a choice to abandon it and like simplify. And in fact, it's already there. So like modern bootloaders leave you in 32 bit mode, like U UEFI leaves you in 16 bit mode, right? But BIOS leaves, oh, leave you in 32 bit mode. But uh, U UEFI just, uh, uh, probably leaves you in 32 bit mode right okay well, i forget what i was saying so like like there's a little bit of magic here right so there's there's those registers like cr0 and i i didn't want to spend a lot of time because uh, i i kind of assigned you to read about them and it it maybe it's not really strictly required to to know everything about them but essentially what you're doing here you say look just set this flag protect protection extension so essentially just make sure that CPU says, okay, like I get it. Like uh, when we do a long jump, we will we'll start executing, uh, and the the GDT will kick in, right? And the address translation will kick in. And uh, again, this long jump instruction essentially switches us from, like, essentially says, okay, please choose an entry in the GDT and start executing at this address. And this label it says start thirty two. Like you actually physically instruct the assembly assembler to produce 16-bit code before that label. And after that label, you switch to say, okay, like now produce 32-bit machine instructions. They are slightly different just because like the sizes of the sizes of uh, operands, because memory addresses are different. Suddenly they are not 16 anymore, not 16 bits, but 32 bits. And again, like uh, there will be another level for you to understand it because in my whole work, it will be like a lengthy assignment with lots of text where you say, look, you read about it and I ask you to essentially uh, boot into main and build your own page table. And you will have to like uh, teach those instructions yourself and understand at least at some level how then how they work. And I've seen like, again, like funny combinations where people like just reorder them randomly uh, because I don't know why actually because the text probably is more or less clear for how to do that. But again, it's not that hard, but again, when you read and do it yourself once, then it's understanding is, is way better. And again, if you ask me, okay, do I understand it? If you like wake me up at 5, 5 in, in, in the morning, do I remember this? Normally not, but every time we build a new kernel, every time I build a new kernel and I don't have a luxury of building one like that often, but when I build it, okay, I, I, I recap. And there are still like those tiny quirks, which you like every time you read an Intel manual, you, you still, you're always surprised because, okay, man, like really this, this tiny detail matters. It was, it used to work all the time, but suddenly it doesn't because, you know, something changed. But 
you at least have to understand like uh, have to understand the high level picture here. And this is actually this is the uh, directive to the to the assembler to say from here on start generating 32 bit code. And this is just it can be any name start 32, but it's just convenient for everyone to to understand. Okay, like now we start running 32 bit code. Okay, so got it right. So I hope. Despite the fact that we like we've seen a lot of like low level things, I hope that uh, at least uh, uh, at this point we have some high level picture of what right. So this is okay. Let's let's finish now building this first page table. It's a little mysterious, and again, like in a couple of slides, I, I will explain the mystery why. Like the mystery is the following: uh, like from this diagram, in which I say, look, I want to put the kernel. At the second gigabyte here, right? Or like specifically second gigabyte plus one megabyte, right? Why am I talking about two entries? Why do I need really two entries in the page table? If I really need just one, who can tell me up front? Maybe some people know or guessed already. No, because both entries, look, both entry, the entry which maps which maps address zero to four megabytes. To physical zero to four megabytes, and the entry which maps two gigabytes uh, to two gigabytes plus four megabytes, they also map to the same physical addresses, right? So it's kind of like semantically the same entry. I mean, not like it's not semantically the same entry, but they map to the same physical addresses, right? So why do we need two? Nope. In fact, I will discard this page table uh, in the second half of this class today. It's just a temporary one. But there is like a, there is a tiny quirk which which forces you to have these two entries. I will I'll come back to it again. Like bear with me. So I get like like two entries. Why two entries? Like not immediately clear. You will see in a second. Okay. So cool. So and this is where what we were discussing last time we said okay look uh, like we never seen a page table right really because I, I say that the cpu wants something in a page how do we even define it and here i say look it's just an array in c a, array of uh, page table directory entries right uh we have 1024 of them and we also have to make sure that this is important because people were missing this in homework assignment if you don't align it because you don't know, like maybe you already allocated four bytes in a in a data section. So this starts at at the beginning of a four thousand ninety six byte boundary plus four, and then the hardware just says, okay, I'm not going to run it. So it's an exception, right? So this align attribute attribute which says, okay, align it to a page size is very important, right? And it tells you tells the compiler that you have to uh, put this data structure at the beginning of this of align boundary, which is four thousand ninety six bytes, right? Okay, cool. And again, a little bit of magic here. We say, look, uh, we have 1,024 entries, but we don't largely care about them. So we initialize only two of them, right? So we initialize entry number zero and entry number 512, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because remember how the translation works, because uh, if you're using four kilobyte pages, if you have an address, that, like the address itself is 32 bit, but the top 10 bits of the address decide which entry you're you're trying to access, right? So if you like the bits here, the 22 bits are just an offset within one four megabyte page, right? Mm -hmm. Because like that's enough to address four megabytes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, those 10 says, okay, I decide which page page I'm accessing. So and if you're accessing physical page uh, zero, then you will have zero here. And if you're accessing a page which leads to the second gigabyte, uh, then it will be entry 512, which is specifically splits the address space in half. This. In total, there is like 1,024 entries encoded by 10 bits, right? And 512 is exactly in the middle, so which is not surprising. Two gigabytes are exactly in the middle as well, right? And the rest of those entries are just zeros, right? So, and it's important because what you're saying, okay, look, uh, those flags which decide what these entries, uh, how they perform, essentially this the bit present says that translation entry is valid. And if the hardware work, walks through entry number one, for example, it this bit is not set and it immediately triggers a page fault, right? Because the translation, the page is not present, right? 
And so we here we said, okay, physical address or a physical page number of a page we're mapping virtual page zero uh, is zero because that's where we want it to map. And the same for the page 512, right? Uh, it's also zero and the pages are writable. And to explain the hardware that it doesn't have to follow into the next level of a page table, we say, well, it's actually a, a super page, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, we, we got this, right? So, and in the end, when we, if we enable this page table, our address space will look exactly like this. Just, this is our virtual address space. Remember linear is always before virtual, right? Uh, do I get the, do I get the, uh, 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 this is actually called, so this is called logical, like segmentation translates it to linear. So this is my drawing that you have code and data and linear, which is synonym to virtual, right? Essentially looks like there are only two entries which are mapped. Each entry is four megabytes. They are not drawn to scale. So this one four megabytes and this one four megabytes and their st starting addresses are zero and uh, two gigabytes, right? And the page table itself is this, two entries, everything else is zero and like remember, if this is where we loaded the kernel, there will be a data section in which this page table will be allocated, right? So I just draw it here. I don't know exactly the address, but just roughly speaking, it's exactly there, right? Agree? Any questions about it? Yeah. So you're putting the user's page table where it's being mapped? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So when you say user's page table, what do you mean by that? That's accessible. But yes, possibly. All right. So okay. So first of all, no, that's a great question. So first of all, and it will be okay, and I will reiterate it multiple times in this class. Really? <laughs> so that my walk and walk and tablet died on me like right away. Let me just restart it. Uh I hope it will. That's just What I wanted to say is the page table is shared, right? So the page table, like there is one physical register which points to the root of the page table, right? This is the register which is currently used by the hardware. All the translations are, are going through that page table, right? And uh, if you're running in, uh, in uh, user level, which means that your privilege level, which I yet have not explained, but let's just bear with me for a second. Privilege level three. Some of those entries will trigger a page fault because they are not accessible through the at, at level at, at, a, at the privilege level three, which is a user privilege level, which means that the page table is the same. It's shared between user and, and kernel, right? And uh, and uh, uh, the page table is the same. And uh, like literally, it just uh, like some of those entries remember. I, I, I talked about it a little bit, uh, but maybe it wasn't uh, completely clear. Just come back here, just find my presentation. So these entries might have a bit which says user accessible or not. And when I created these two entries, I didn't set that bit. So it's this page table can only be accessed from privilege level zero from the kernel. When we will start constructing page tables, which, which will be, really used by both kernel and a the user, then we will set those bits in some of the entries, which will be accessible to the user. Is that, does it answer your question? Or what, what is that you? I, I think we can have to go back to the boxes. <laughs> okay, and, no, like it, it will become more clear. Just forget about user and a kernel for a second. Uh, okay, cool. So we got this page table, right? What we're doing here is that uh, again, a little bit of low-level magic. We say, look, again, we, you cannot just do this or instruction on a CR0 register. That's why you first copy the CR0 into EX register, then set these two flags saying, okay, like enable page table uh, and just move it back in CR0, right? And at this point you say, look, yes, uh, this thing will be uh, used. Right. And again, like, don't forget that if you ever, and I ask you to start reading the source code, and this is the source code, this is the file entry.s 
from which, and those are actual lines which are on the PDF, which you print out, like uh, which which represent the printout of the kernel. So go ahead and read them, and you will understand that okay, like like uh, this is what the kernel is doing, right? Uh, and just to illustrate my point right here, so let's just uh, let's just quickly uh, like go and take a look at this entry.c just just to just to trust ourselves that we are really uh, uh, we are really doing what we want to do. So just put this here so it's on the screen a little bit uh, small. Let me just make it uh, Accessibility shortcuts. Yeah, I'm sorry. We don't need those right now. So if we do an open entry.s, this is exactly the code which I was talking about it, right? And this is similar to what you're gonna build in your uh in your homework, right? So essentially, like you will have to build this multi-boot header, you will learn what it means. But remember, we started the kernel at this uh, entry, it was the entry point of the kernel. We this this is the code which essentially enables four megabyte extensions, right? This is the code which loads the uh, address of the entry page directory. This is the which we just declared into the CR3 register, which holds the root of the page table. And immediately after that, uh, we say, "Wow, by the way, enable paging." So, which means that uh, this next instruction, when we loaded the CR0, right, the next instruction, so specifically this one, will be running with, uh, will be going through a page table, right, right. I ask you a question uh, what this instruction is doing. The comment is self explanatory. Mm -hmm. So we are essentially saying, okay, forget about the stack which we use for 7C00. Let's set up a new stack, right? Uh, and I will explain in a second. And, and here we will jump to main. So, right, so this entry, entry.c is not a big, not a big file, like 10, 10 lines of code, right? So just wanted to make sure that despite the fact that I'm talking about it for like two hours, it's really just 10 lines of code, right? And it's very easy to read. And especially after having high level, having some high, high level understanding of what it's doing, it's it just trivial, right? And it, my, my goal was to, to convince you that it's that easy to boot into it, right? Okay. Uh, we're good? Yep. It's 32 bits. This version of XB6, which we're using in this class, it's a 32-bit version of the of the XB6 kernel. What's what? I mean, the, as I remember, when looking at the XB6 public online, it's 64 bits. Okay. Right. Hold on. So MIT like depends like on or on which version you're looking. Which version? I'll, I'll I'll put a link. So we will use we're using this version. MIT moved to a version which is uh, implemented for RISC five processor. I didn't want to do it, and they also did a couple of design choices which I disagree with, like how they set up page tables and everything. So I like it this way for now. Okay, cool. So da, 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 what I wanted to do, I wanted to. Okay, cool. Like going back to the slide deck. Where's the slide deck? Okay, back here. Okay, so we enable paging, as I was saying, right? Uh, uh, we then said, okay, like, by the way, we want a new stack. So just initialize ESP register with a new value. The way we define the stack is we use assembly directive saying, okay, like reserve for uh, 4096 bytes for this stack, right? Again, you can do it in C, you can just say, Declare me, like, give me an array of characters of 4096 bytes, maybe page aligned, maybe dot is not page aligned, doesn't matter because stack doesn't have to be page aligned, right? But uh, we do this because we don't want to, like, uh, let the kernel run on some, like, semi weird stack which we just created during the boot, right? Question. This is uh, during the boot. Prior to yep, this right here. This this directive. Yeah. 
it's the way to declare data variables in assembly. So it's essentially set, you, it's the way to say, look, reserve me that much space. Okay. It, and it goes into a data section. Okay. So it doesn't look like you're out from the page. Well, it's a page because I set uh, 4,096 bytes, right? But I'm not saying page align. I don't think I do. Wow. It doesn't matter at this point, right? So stack can be, but if I ask you like, uh, how big is the kernel stack? You can tell me if you 4,096 bytes. What happens if you run out of stack? What happens? Can you, can anyone tell me? Page fold. Page fold? Maybe if you're lucky, but it's like in our homework. Sometimes you crash and sometimes you don't. Right, and this you load the L file, and it actually runs, but it reads some values from memory because it's math. Yeah. This gives you a wrong answer. Mm -hmm. So it depends, right? So in this specific case, depends on where this variable is located in the data section, and if you're running out of stack, you just will be overriding data from the memory underneath it, right? So it's a good good debugging exercise to say like what really happens. We can we can try. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So uh, this is our system, like we already talked uh, a bunch. So the new update is that this is the kernel stack now, right? Remember I said that the page table sits in a data section and the blue stack sits somewhere next door to the, to the page table, right? So I don't really exactly know where it is in the data section, but it's somewhere there. And of course it's mapped twice, right? Like you were asking whether the same physical memory is used, right? It's the same physical memory, which is just simply mapped twice, right? once at the lower addresses and once at the higher addresses, right? At this point, I say, okay, I have a stack. Let's just jump to main, right? And uh, what I do here is that uh, I move the address of the main function into the EIX, and then I'm jumping to the address contained in the EIX, right? And the reason for that is in this comment, right? So if I simply say jump to main, then uh, the compiler, like we've seen it before, it will generate a relative jump, say jump 20 bytes forward. That's not what we want because 20 bytes forward will still be at in the range of one megabyte plus something, right? But what we really want to do, we want to start executing it in the range of addresses, which is eight, which is two gigabytes plus something, right? So in this, like really to avoid this relative jump, like, my goal is to have this instruction pointer to point to two gigabytes plus something after that, right? Okay. And after that, like I didn't even call the main, right? So I just jumped to it, which is another cheating. So you say, look, wow, the stack is there. I don't really have to call because I never plan to return. So that's totally fine. But this is where, this is how you find yourself in the beginning of the main function. This is this actually kind of completes your boot sequence. And after that, you like your normal, you say, look, I'm back to my wonderful C language. I can start initializing the kernel. I'm happy. I know I can run, right? So questions about it. And then I will come back with a question. Yeah, question. You just still don't say why the both are the uh, Why do we need two entries, right? Yeah. That yeah, will be my question in a second. So two entries are why they are both located at zero page. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll come back in a second. That will be my question. So there was another question, right? Yeah. Man, like I should teach like that, like Python. Some I don't really remember this. Right, right, right. Uh, I. Yeah, it's in the source, and that's a great question. And I, uh, I have a, I have an anecdote for that. So I, I once was uh, coding something similar to this, but different, and it was all user level, some kind of like user level threats, and I forgot this asterisk. The bugging was insane. <laughs> I don't remember the syntax. I should have been. Yeah, why do this? Okay, what did what does it say? Indirect jump, but why why the asterisks? Why why do they need? Because I I would also imagine you should just say jump EAX. Why why they came up with this weird syntax? No idea. Because you know.
No, I, like if I would put something like asterisk uh, full bar, and then we would pick the. the Right. So how about, that's a great question, by the way. So you guys are looking. So how about we try, like, I'll try after the class. And I, I'm pretty sure it will compile. My anecdote, I think, is true. And I think it will compile. Uh, in fact, uh, let me, while, while doing this, let me quickly, and like, what is it I'm doing here? Let me just quickly move my shells here so we don't. It's okay. So today we actually have time and we can spend a little bit of time doing this. Uh, what I wanted to, to show, um, which will be a little harder, which I cannot show because I have to set up a VPN to access, uh, to access. Uh, I wanted to compile it and see, but okay. So forget about it. So I apologize. So I will, I'll do it. I'll do it next time. But uh, my point is that I'm pretty sure that the code will compile and uh, execute. And the question is like, what will be the bug? And I, I know that's interesting. So we can, we can do it as a as an extra credit, right? Uh, there was a, another question. I forgot. Someone was raising hand. Okay, but we got to me, right? So, and now I will ask you a question. So, why do I really need these two entries? Right. Sorry. Let me just enable here why two what's wrong with having just one entry because really we just need this one right like do you get the point okay uh okay let me let me ask it differently so we we have a slightly better if my my pen doesn't work oh it does man somehow like after like random manipulations it actually came back came back alive that's that's excellent uh first of all if we so badly want to have the kernel at this address range, which is around two gigabytes, why can't we just copy when we were doing bootloading? Why can't we just, instead of choosing this address, why can't we choose an address which is right here, which is at two gigabytes, and just put it there and just happily leave with that and, and don't worry about like remapping it? Why? Who knows the answer? It's an easy question, so don't be shy. Your system might not have that much. Yeah, exactly. So, like, especially back in the days, the system of five twelve megabytes was a luxury, right? So, just like logical addresses are there, but physical memory might not be there. And in fact, x with six with with a default make file which says, okay, let's run the QM emulator. I forget exactly the number, but it doesn't allocate even five twelve megabytes, right? So that's why you cannot really uh, load this into this range of addresses and then just leave one-to-one -one mapping, right? Is that clear, this idea? Mm -hmm. Another reason is that it's even worse because I think, uh, no, I thought that we still stayed in like 16-bit mode. No, we, we are not, we are in 32-bit mode. So really this megabyte is accessible in 32-bit mode. Okay, uh, that's that's cool. Uh, we, we got the point, so we, we, we got, we, we say, okay, like really physically, we need to load the kernel at around one megabyte because we know for sure that there will be physical memory. But then if I ask you a question, why do we need this entry? Why do we need the entry number one? Man, like what is like wrong with this? Let me just uh, grab a physical cable for this, my pen. So I disconnect again, but still think think about the question. So what's, what, what's, the, what's the answer here? Why do we need two entries? Why not one? It's a, it's a good homework exercise. I should actually, I should assign it and say like, remove this second entry, the first entry, which maps uh, the address range from zero to four megabytes and see what happens. And you guys should answer. But let's do it right now. Anyone know the answer? What will happen if I simply, if I simply remove this entry from the page table? It's actually not even, okay, let me just, and slideshow for a second. You have the answer? Okay, tell me. Right, that's, yeah. And so what will happen immediately? Correct. 
So, or more specifically, let's go back for a second to this, uh, to, to the source code of the kernel, right? There is a little bit of a thing which I didn't discuss here. Uh, your ex this entry, what do you think is this, the address of the entry? Like if you were doing a readout on this, what kind of address it, it will show you? In what address range, roughly? Around one megabyte, around two gigabytes, where? Anyone? Around, one around one megabyte. But uh, why do you think so? Because if I show you the linker, and I didn't, it actually links the kernel to run at the address range around two gigabytes, right? So probably entry is just a regular address, a regular label, which will be there at, at two gigabytes, right? Because the whole kernel is actually linked because in the end goal, the, our end goal is to run it there, right? So all the like stack variable, entry page directory var variable, they all will show up and because they are linked to, to be there, right? But somehow we're still magically executing this code at around first megabyte. So your intuition is correct. So we're like e instruction pointer when we point, when instruction pointer executes this instruction, it's literally one megabyte plus something, plus some small offset, right? And we keep running it. So like it keeps growing. Look at this wonderful macro. So in fact, when I'm saying to use this page table, I'm not saying use this address directly, which is a two gigabyte. I apply this macro. And this macro is virtual to physical. What it does is actually subtracts two gigabytes from the address. So it shifts it back in the lower address range, right? So literally I say, look, uh, the physical address of the page table will not be in the range of two gigabytes because really it's, it's not there. It's it, the physically it's, it's, it's around one gigabyte, right? And I, I say, okay, so if you take entry page directory, subtract, uh, let me quickly see if I have a uh, read health. Uh, yuck. How about uh, we go here? Just wanted to show you this thing. Uh, we'll get there in a second, just a second. So we can go, hmm. I hope I have it, no, I don't. Uh, about, uh, so this is the repo we're using, uh, control C. Um, hmm. Let me just quickly clone XV6 and uh, build it for you, just to make sure that we are on the same page here. Really? Uh, that's, again, that's how you build XV6, not super hard, just make. Uh, if I do read alpha on it, minus A, kernel, uh, and I will do grab uh, entry. So this is my entry page directory, right? So we all now are familiar with readout. That's very convenient. So we are, have good understanding. This is the address at which it's allocated, right? So it's so this eight means that it's second gigabyte. Again, splits the address space exactly in half, right? And if I say, look, by the way, so if I, like when I do entry dot s, I apply this wonderful macro. Oh, nice color scheme. <laughs> Bleeding. Uh, uh, physical to virtual, right? Or B2P, right? Physical to virtual. So really, I just, uh, like this label start, it's actually artificially manufactured. So it, instead of like, if you say, well, I want to take a look at the entry, right? So the entry itself is also, at the second gigabyte. But if you say, I want to look at the start, the start is a different label. And this is around one, one megabyte, right? So I just subtracted two to make sure that 
I actually I made up some addresses which are within the which which I can use before I enable the page table, right? But what I meant to to show you is this story, right? So the moment you, oh sorry, word. The moment you enable page table here, right? What is the value of your instruction pointer? What is the address range? Like, that's just to give you a hint, uh, or not a hint, right? just to motivate you. I used to ask questions like that on the exam, right? Because uh, on the final exam. Why is that? So I, I I requested people like read and understand the source code of X plus six, kind of like ninety percent understanding. Uh, you say, "Well, do I really have to?" Uh, I don't know. Maybe, right? So, but now I will try to explain it. So, what is the what is the value of the instruction pointer when we're executing this instruction? Again, how to go about it, right? Remember the slide deck. If we if we go back to the slide deck. I can only find it. It's my calendar. Uh, let me just figure out. Like before we enable the page table, right? What happens before we enable the page table? Before we enable the page table, initially our instruction pointer was 7C00. We were executing here. We jumped to the start of the kernel, right? But the kernel is physically around first megabyte, right? So you, and we're still executing this file entry.s. So we didn't do anything. We didn't jump anywhere, right? So we're somewhere around the first megabyte. Agree with this? Our instruction pointer is here. And then we suddenly say, enable paging, which means that all the addresses. So if you have an address, which is like one megabyte plus some delta, it suddenly goes, has to go through the page table. If you don't have this entry, you immediately have a page fault, right? Because this address is like, like literally you're executing here, somewhere here, right? And you say, wow, but if there is no entry for this, for the, for the, for the addresses from zero to four megabyte, you immediately page fault, right? Why assembly just get the offset from the page tables and um, always reference the addresses of the actual, the second virtual space? Like, Meaning, why don't I change the instruction pointer to be here, right? Or, or just like, is there a way of pouring the page table of like the offset, the physical address versus the, the virtual address? And just adding that to your... No, this is what the page table is doing, but you can't do it. So meaning that when you in in execute this move instruction, which resets the control register to say enable paging, the very next instruction goes through the through the page table, right? Which means that you cannot atomically change the instruction pointer to point somewhere else. It just increments by the size of the instruction which you were executing, right? And so you can jump. Your next very next instruction can be a jump, and you can jump to the higher addresses, like somewhere here, right? That would be fine, but like this jump will fail because it's still you will not be able to fetch the, the CPU will not be able to fetch the jump instruction from memory because it's not mapped. And that's that's the only reason why for this for the window of like three instructions before we after we enable paging and before we did this jump uh, asterisk EAX, where the this this EAX is actually the the I forgot where we jumped. We jumped to main, right? And if I show you, if I show you the main instruction, it will be actually like in the like main itself as a symbol is linked to be somewhere around two gigabytes plus one plus one megabyte, right? So but for this for the several instructions which we're executing here, we need this first, we need this entry in the page table. And after that we can discard it completely. We will never come back to it. Is that does it make sense? Question. You mean like 
somewhere early during the boot, you say, let's jump somewhere here. You, you possibly can if as long as you have physical memory here. But again, physical memory is like a resource. Like uh, imagine like it's, it's like chairs in the room. At some point, the room will be full, right? And you say, look, I'm, I'm very careful. I, I push whoever comes first. I, I put them in the very corner of this. This is what the bootloader is doing. And then I will be filling the first row. And suddenly you say, wow, I can do this trick. And I can say that somewhere in the middle of a room will be my my boot, 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 boot sequence as well. But you're kind of losing this, this the couple of chairs, right? And if you really want to be careful about physical memory, you and of course you can you can deallocate this one, and it's all arguable choices. But uh, in in this specific case, you don't even know whether you have memory here, although you could do this trick. The moment you switch to, the moment you switch to, uh, if for example you switch to thirty two bit mode here during the boot, you somehow query the bias and say, look, I, I do really have uh, physical memory in this second gigabyte, then you can really load the kernel right here and avoid doing this trick. That's totally possible. But again, just for, for the cases where you're on some embedded system, like literally, if you buy like a sensor, like this remote probably runs some kind of an operating system, right? Because when you click a button, there will be a Wi-Fi protocol or whatever the protocol, like it's infrared, right? So which connects to this, like there will be a tiny operating system. It actually boots when you plug the batteries, right? So the boot is less sophisticated because I doubt it. It's probably like 8-bit microcontroller, maybe 16-bit, right? So like you don't always have the luxury of big memories, right? But okay, so cool. So did we did we get uh, what's happening? Just, just to not lose the scope of everything, including the memory of the but what are it? That's a good look. But bias we don't even see. Remember, as I would say, the bias was running, then theoretically it should clean up after itself and leave us clean memory in practice, who knows? And system management mode, remember I was saying system management mode keeps hiding. It could potentially punch a hole in this memory region and say, I will be running here. If you try to access it, exception, and you will never go forward. So better build your operating system in such a way, manner that it never access this physical region. And it will be sitting there forever until we power off the machine. Right? Okay, so like a little bit of a weird trick, I agree, like that's why it's, it's hard to explain. So two entries, why two entries? Uh, maybe there is a better punchline for how the like, or ex exposition line. Uh, for how to explain it. But I hopefully, like, since we did a couple of circles around it, now we will understand. So if I ask you, okay, like, the, the reason I'm spending so much time, first of all, because I have time, right? We have a long semester. Second, because we will have a homework, and I will ask you to do the same. In your homework, I will not ask you to remap the kernel, because, again, it's a design choice. I say, like, well, forget about it. I don't care about uh, freeing the lower virtual addresses for the process. We will just stay like exactly where we loaded the kernel and we'll just build a page table which covers this region of one megabyte plus something. And, and then you understand, okay, cool. I, I don't really have to do anything because my address space will be different, right? My virtual address space. Okay, so good for now. Okay. Uh, again, just let's recap one more time. So we, when, we, when we wake up tomorrow, we all remember it. Uh, so again, it's reasonably simple. Despite the fact that I was circling around, like talking about hardware, different constructions here, what conceptually happened is the following, right? So we said, okay, we started in 16-bit mode. We have to set up the, the global descriptor table, right? With just two segments, data and code. And we did it in assembly, right? You can do it in C if you say, look, guys, I don't know how to program assembly. Forget about it. Just do this array in C. Just make sure that the, the, the C representation of the global descriptor table matches what CPU wants to find. And the symbol which points to the global descriptor table is visible in your assembly, then it's, it's just fine. You can do the same, right? Then we switch to protected mode with a long jump. Now we're running in 32-bit mode. We can access addresses uh, for up to four GBs, right? So which means that we can definitely can access addresses at around one megabyte, right? Uh, we said, okay, forget about running in assembly. 
even to load the kernel from disk, we want C. So that's why we set up the stack and we started running C code. And the C code we used still, this is still, this is still the bootloader. In the bootloader, we say like load the kernel from disk. Again, reasonably simple. It's a little mysterious because suddenly I introduce a disk driver, right? But it looked uh, sufficiently simple, uh, right? So like just some in and out instructions in some magical locations, right? And then we said, okay, now we can jump to the entry point of the kernel. And what the kernel is doing first is said, okay, I want to remap myself uh, from the low addresses of from zero to four megabytes to the high addresses at two gigabytes plus to two gigabytes plus four. And we did it. We set up a high address stack, which is a variable in the data section of the kernel, and we jumped to me. Again, conceptually, re relatively simple. Right? And you can play with this sequence. So it doesn't have to be strictly this, but like more or less all the steps will be needed in order to boot into main. Yeah, this, uh, the fourth step, set up that to call the function that's uh, inside the user space or? No, remember? Okay, who can tell me which, what is the address of this stack? That's a good question. So let's cl cl clarify. So first of all, the question was, is it inside the user address space? No, like because we don't even know yet. I didn't even explain what user is, right? So it's just CPU just executing something. At some point, I will show you what it means to be inside the user. But who remembers the address of this stack? Before the 0x7c00. Zero zero. So this is exactly where ESP will be pointing, which means that the first push instruction will decrement the ESP and put yeah, the value I like remember. right below it, right? And the time address stack that will be inside the kernel. Eventually, yes. Eventually, what's this. The... Mm -hmm. What's the? So the first one, right? You can use the C function. How about the second stack? The high end stack. What's the function? Uh, yeah. This is the stack which will be used by the CPU zero uh, inside the kernel. So we like when we execute main. We jumped into main, so I didn't do a call, but essentially the very first instruction inside main. Good, like exam level question. What is the very first instruction inside main? Who can tell me? For the midterm. No, like think a little bit deeper, like. What is this absurd question? How can I, do I even know what the first instruction inside main is? Like, like I showed you main, main is this, right? But if I ask you, what is the first instruction inside main? You still know the answer. So who knows the answer? Again, part of this class is kind of like, it's kind of x-ray discipline. You can, you, you, you need to learn to see through the code. This and this, what's inside, what is executing? Warm. Yeah, so you will maintain the stack frame pointer. Because uh, remember, I, I keep mentioning multiple times that we will, uh, X with six will be maintaining the stack frame. So what it will do, it will push EBP, right? That's the very first instruction which the kernel will execute, right? And again, it's a little bit of a trickier question. And I, I, I'm not going to ask you that, but but the fact that you actually can look at this code, and if someone asks you what what's the first instruction, you can actually you you actually know, and I can I can show it to you real quick. Correct, correct. Yeah, prolog which pushes the EDP. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So and let's just just double check that we we are on the same page here. So if we do obj dump uh, feed right, let's choose uh, Intel of the kernel and we will have to pipe it through less if we have uh, this is our entry function not surprising right but we are looking for main uh mp main this is the main right so this is the very first instruction which the kernel executes in c right again kind of uh again why is it useful in practice is it just is it a question which i 
just decided to ask because I, I want to showcase how smart I am. In practice, it's useful because sometimes you ended up loading the main at some wrong address. You just made a mistake. The disk drive driver is wrong. You start single stepping inside GDB. And at this point, you can say, okay, am I really executing the main function? Because those bytes, 55, which is push EBP, or even if the disassembly shows you something, if it shows you something absolutely random, you clearly know it's not a function entry. It's some random crop. And I just like ended up executing some random address because I made a mistake. And so you go, you go and debug. So what I'm trying to showcase here is this kind of how to go about this, like, What's the intuition? Like, for example, in this homework, when I ask you to, when I ask you to uh, load the, what is that? Uh, I forgot the name of the function, not the magic, but the, this the one quadruple or computer quadruple, right? Yeah. Uh, you like you say you I single step into the function with GDB. Am I seeing the the stack frame instruction? If yes, that I'm at the beginning of the entry function. If not. Your jump, you jump somewhere else, right? And you you better understand where you loaded it. Oh, it doesn't on mine, on a, in a homework. Yeah. Correct. So it does emit stack for it. Stack frame pointer. Like, and the reason for this is just to simplify debugging so we can do a backtrace. If we crash somewhere later on in X with six, uh, you can say, look, uh, can I, like, typically GDB will show you a backtrace, but uh, if you don't really like, if you don't somehow, if you don't have it, so then you can take a look at the EBP and the return addresses and stuff like that. Okay, so good. All right, so again, just again, wanted to make sure that we understand that there is no like no super duper like hidden secrets here so everything what uh, you know you have your files of the kernel you have some assembly files you just go ahead compile it link it and it will run as as expected okay cool so this is like uh, the end of our wonderful put into main sequence right and i still have 10 minutes so let's not waste them uh, and we will quickly switch to our next lecture, which we will continue next time. But uh, just uh, philosophically, I will ask you first the question. So what do you think is next? So kind of the big achievement is unlocked, right? So we, we booted into main. Somehow, you know, like it seems almost impossible to, to boot on bare metal into main, but yeah, we did it. And so the next question is like now you're you're programming the kernel really. So what do what do you think you need to do? What's next? Like define kernel versus user space. I mean, the way you word it is obviously a little obscure, but conceptually I agree with you. So and I, I'll come back to my, like, I, I refer back to my introductory, introductory lecture. I was saying, so, like, really conceptually, what is the operating system, right? If you're running on this microcontroller, your only goal in life is to be able to react when you, when you, when you press a button, it should send some signal, right, to, the, to this projector, right? And you say, look, maybe I already like just simply execute this code inside this main function and it just loops around, waits for the button input. Maybe just maybe there is some kind of an interrupt when you press a button. Maybe you're just pulling for those buttons like endlessly, saying, okay, did, did the, was the button pressed? Was, was it not pressed, right? But uh, in, in many cases, you want to build something more sophisticated. You, you really want to execute processes, right? And that's, that's the diagram which you kind of have in mind. You say, look, I boot it into main, so, and I keep drawing main as this yellow code. So your main is here. And at this point, your next step is to probably say, look, how about I will boot into the very first process? It can be init and it can be your shell, right? Shell, init typically takes a password to make sure that, you know, when I, I like verify that the user can use a system, right? But conceptually, you can say, well, I really want to boot into shell. Uh, if you're running on some device like a phone, right? So then you say, look, 
I don't really boot in, don't want to boot into shell. I want to boot into this uh, GUI environment, which shows me some buttons right on the screen, right? But conceptually, it's the same. So your goal is to start building those processes. And as you say, what is a process? I, I keep saying that, okay, it's actually an address space, which means that it's a page table, right? So roughly speaking, your goal is to execute as you execute some kind of exact on it, right? To make sure that you can construct new new processes, right? And uh, totally, I agree with you. Your goal is to essentially be able to construct page tables for new processes, right? How would you do this? What, what does it mean to construct a page table? Tell me. Totally. So what you just said is that actually, uh, like what you're saying is that, let me just find some free space here. Like imagine this is your page table directory. Uh, and the end goal is to say, control register three points to this page table directory. And these guys actually point to some kind of a page table entries or page yeah. tables, right? And we say, well, we'll construct some address space, which has maybe a maps address. Like if this is your address space of a process, this is address zero. So it will be mapped to some physical page, right? Mm -hmm. But even in order to construct this page table, you can see that in this example, you really need three pages. So meaning that as you said, you say, well, page one, page two may be coming from here and page three might be coming from next to it, right? You really need a mechanism which allows you to track which physical memory is available or not. Because if it's already used by, for example, the kernel, right? Maybe the main function is sitting here. So those two pages should not be available for you to construct the page table, right? And what it means is that we, the very first thing you want to do is you say, look, by the way, I want to build something what keeps track of physical memory, available physical memory. And this is called the memory allocator. And it will be a very simple one in our, in our example, like uh, in X with six, right? But I will teach you how to build a more sophisticated one as well, right? But at least we got the logic. We say, look, if we somehow uh, keep track of which physical memory is available, we, the moment we want to construct a page table, we say something like allocate a page, alloc page, and it will give us a pointer to a fresh page and so on, right? And from there we say, look, let's construct the very first page table and uh, eventually let's boot into the first process, right? And so, okay, so let me stop here and we will continue. Unfortunately, after the spring break, we will start uh, creating this uh, memory allocator and then we will understand how we will create the very first process. So, okay, just a quick reminder, my office hours are right now. So at 11, because I didn't do them on Tuesday, our midterm is next Thursday, same time, same place in this, in this class. And uh, on Tuesday, we'll have a recap lecture. So thank you. We'll see you. See you Tuesday.